Hello, this is Josh, first mate on the AJ Mirwald, bringing you another episode of Science and Sailors. Today, we'll be continuing our plankton series with a discussion of the importance of plankton to life on the ocean and on land. Just to recap, in our last discussion, we discussed that plankton are plants, animals, and bacteria that live in the water but that cannot swim against the current. Phytoplankton are plants and zooplankton are animals. Both of these play a crucial role in the health of not only our oceans, but everything on land as well. So, what makes plankton so important? Well, I for one am a big fan of breathing. Specifically, I like to breathe air that contains oxygen. Oxygen is used by our bodies to feed our brains and muscles, and without it, we would die. In fact, all animals rely on oxygen even ones that live underwater. Most aquatic animals, with the exception of marine mammals, do not have to come to the surface to breathe. Do you guys think that any animals can breathe water? Can a fish breathe water? Actually, they cannot. Um, they extract oxygen that is dissolved in the water, little O2 molecules, using their gills or other special organs, depending on what the creature is. On land, animals extract oxygen from the air using their lungs. The important part to remember is that oxygen is absolutely essential for all animals to be alive. And where does that oxygen come from? From plants, of course. Plants use sunlight, nutrients, and carbon dioxide to produce oxygen. There are lots and lots of plants in the ocean, including various types of seaweeds, kelps, and of course, Phytoplankton. <clears throat> Phytoplankton are very efficient oxygen producers, and scientists estimate that about 50 to 85 percent of all the oxygen in Earth's atmosphere is produced by these little phytoplankton. So next time you take a breath, thank a plankton. The second reason plankton are important has to do with the concept that you probably already know about. Who likes to eat fish? If you do, you owe another thank you to the plankton. Plankton form the base of the aquatic food web. Food webs are a way to describe the exchange of energy from the sun all the way through all of the living organisms in an ecosystem. With very few exceptions, all life on Earth ultimately receives this energy from the sun. Plants are the organisms that can take the sun's energy and convert it into a form of energy that can sustain life. This process is called photosynthesis. Plants are intermediary uh, between the sun and all life on earth. They produce usable energy for everyone else. Therefore, we call them primary producers. Without plants, all other life would eventually die out because we are not able to directly use the sun's energy. On land, grass, trees, and all of our crops are primary producers. In the ocean, phytoplankton and other marine plants like this sea lettuce, which is a type of seaweed, are the, phyto are the uh, primary producers. They're the ones that are doing photosynthesis, creating the oxygen that you need to survive. So how do we get energy from plants? We eat them! Animals can eat plants in order to gain energy. Animals that eat plants are called herbivores, or primary consumers, because they are the first creatures to consume the energy that the plants produced. Can you think of some examples of primary consumers on land? Maybe cows, deer, and squirrel. Those are examples of primary consumers on land because they eat all plants. In the ocean, zooplankton, some fish, sea turtles, and a few filter feeders eat plants, and those would be known as primary consumers. Not all animals eat plants, however. Some animals only eat other animals. We call these carnivores or secondary consumers. So if you look here, you can see some examples of primary consumers. This is a larval fish, a newborn fish still considered plankton, and he's going to eat some of these phytoplankton. This is a copepod, like in Spongebob, also eating phytoplankton. This is a baby oyster, and just like the baby fish, 
is plankton until it gets older. And this animal is not that small. However, it is an herbivore like a cow. It is a muskrat, but it lives in the water and on land, and they eat plants. Secondary consumers vary quite a bit between land and the water, but some examples are these oysters, which might eat these zooplankton, but you could also put the oyster here depending on if he's eating phytoplankton or if he's eating zooplankton. These two types of fish are very small. This is called a hog choker. This is a little anchovy, and they're going to eat small animals like these larval fish. Can you guess what a tertiary consumer is? These are the animals that eat other carnivores. For instance, eagles, polar bears, tuna, dolphins, and sharks. Where do humans fit in all of this? Well, we eat plants, so you could call us primary consumers, but we also eat cows, so you can consider us secondary consumers. But if we want to, we can also eat large animals, including other apex predators. So we could be tertiary consumers. Um, so we kind of fit into many categories. Similarly, some animals like scavengers or omnivores like pigs and crabs will take advantage of whatever they can find. For instance, a pig will eat um, certain plants that grow underground. They'll also eat other plants and they'll eat meat. And so will a crab. A crab will eat plants if they need to. They will actually hunt and capture fish and other living organisms like a predator. And they will scavenge and eat dead animals, no matter how big they are, because they're dead. Well, this is why we describe it as a food web instead of a food chain, because it's not simple or linear. Many animals can fit into several different categories. As you can see, the creatures that form the basis of the food web are the primary consumers, or sorry, the primary producers. After that, the primary consumers. And aquatic ecosystems, as I already said, these are the phytoplankton, and the zooplankton or zooplankton. Without these organisms, most of the rest of the life in the water would not be able to survive. Not only that, but if these phytoplankton were to perish in the water, many animals on land would also die. For example, if these four types of phytoplankton were to die because of pollution or climate change or some other catastrophe, these zooplankton who relied on those phytoplankton might also die. If these two secondary consumers relied on those exclusively, they might also perish. And if they died, you might find that some of these guys would die as well. And that could affect you on land, especially if you eat fish or um, any other animals that rely on aquatic animals for their sustenance. Like muskrats. Some people will eat muskrats. In the meantime, this worm over here is going to be pretty happy because he's what's known as a decomposer, which includes things like worms and bacteria and fungus that eat dead plants and animals. So as you can see, plankton play a vital role in the health of aquatic and terrestrial environments alike. Without their ability to produce oxygen or their role as a food source, life as we know it would not exist. Can you think of some other ways that plankton benefit us? What could happen if plankton no longer existed? Please share your thoughts in the comments below. This has been Josh with Science and Sailors, bringing the Bayshore to you.